Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today uh, for a hybrid seminar sponsored by the Program on Refugees, Forced Displacement, and Humanitarian Responses at the Macmillan. My name is Catherine Panderbrick. I am Professor of Anthropology, Health, and Global Affairs at Yale. And today I have the pleasure of introducing and hosting our speaker. Uh, let me introduce you briefly to Professor Michael Pluis. He um, is Professor in Developmental Psychology at Queen Mary University of London. So obviously joins us here from the UK for a hybrid seminar. He came to the field of psychology after training in chemistry, music, and therefore has a very interesting personal and scientific background to offer us today. He's um, very well known internationally for his work on environmental sensitivity, uh, which anchors in science the notion that some people are more affected by the very same experience, for example, stress, than others because they are more sensitive to environmental conditions. And that sensitivity shapes our human development over the life course, as he shows in his work. Um, he's also known for work on positive development and resilience, evaluating interventions aimed to promote well being in children and adults. And he leads research on mental health in humanitarian crises, which is where in the area in which our work intersect and how I came to know him as a very generous, a highly productive scholar interested in interdisciplinary work and transnational collaborations. So uh, it's really my pleasure to introduce him to you today. He'll talk about the research that he has led on mental health of Syrian refugee children uh, living in precarious conditions in Lebanon and, his, and the work he has led on phone-based uh, psychological therapy in Lebanon. Um, the title of this is, you know, is, is really a great uh, pleasure to welcome him. The title of his talk today is Prevalence, Predictors and Treatment of Mental Health Problems in Syrian Refugee Children. Uh, before we start, please know that Dr. Pluis welcomes questions, clarifications or concerns during his presentation. So if you have any, uh, please put that in the chat or raise your hand and we'll be able to nudge him uh, to stop and respond to you as he uh, talks to us. Um, so um, welcome, Michael, and it's a great pleasure to hand over to you. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction, and it, it's really great to be here. I've, I've met Catherine quite a while ago uh, when I was at the very beginning of developing this idea, so it's fantastic to be able to be here and to share where we've been and where, what we've managed to do over the last few years. So uh, I wish I was there in person. I was uh, in my music days, oh, actually, uh, I was at Yale um, once, uh, but, uh, and I remember it was, it's, it's really a wonderful, beautiful place. So let me start with um, giving an overview of what, what, what I'd like to cover today. So there's quite a few things. Um, I'd like to first give a background, uh, the Syrian, uh, context, and then I'll introduce the biopath study and several findings. So I will talk about the prevalence of predictors of mental health problems. Uh, I will then talk about risk and resilience factors and the research we've done on that. Then also talk about the dynamic nature of resilience, looking at the longitudinal analysis, and then have some findings on the biological embedding of war exposure. And then I'll talk about the T-CETA study. This is about a phone delivered psychological intervention. I'll present some findings on the efficacy of phone delivered treatment, as well as the feasibility and acceptability of phone delivered treatment. And then I'll discuss those findings. Um, I will discuss them as I present some of them, but I'll be happy to be interrupted. Um, and then I'll, I'll try to bring everything together in this discussion and then have some practical implications at the very end. Um, I'd like to start, however, with uh, hearing from you. And uh, I prepared some questions on Mentimeter. Obviously, you're all experts, but I'd like to know from you um, how many refugees you think that there are currently across the world. And so if you go on menti.com and enter that code, then you can uh, enter your estimate of what you think, how many refugee children we have today across the world. So that can just be a wild guess to the best of your knowledge. Um, 
I'll have some more questions after that. So it's worth logging in. Okay, you can still enter that, but um, I think most of the answers are in the in the right area. So um, the most recent data suggests that there are about 85, 85 million refugees in the world, half of which are children. So it is between 40 and 45 million. So you got that right. Um, so that was an easy question. The next question, <laughs> It's a bit might be a bit more challenging, and uh, because it's not not that uh, obvious necessarily. So, out of these children, how many do you think are suffering from mental health problems? In percentage, what's your guess? Well, we get a bit more of a range here. But the majority suggests 50%. That is, um, I think the whole range that we see represented here is supported by the evidence. And I'll talk a bit more about that. 50% um, is relatively high. Um, Okay, and then the last question is the one regarding treatment. How many of these children that have problems receive mental health treatment? So how many of the refugee children that actually have mental health problems end up receiving mental health treatment? What's your best guess? Okay, so... Yes, that looks, that looks about right. Um, we have quite a few refugee children that have mental health problems and a very small number of children actually receive help that they need. Great, so uh, good responses. And uh, I will provide data on all these questions today. And um, yes, so uh, you were, quite correct in that assessment. Um, some background on the Syrian refugee crisis, I've, I've, so I'm not gonna go in great detail because most of you will be very familiar with this, but this is a long uh, ongoing conflict. So it's, it's already 10 years that this has been going on. And it started with a conflict between the Syrian government and a few rebel groups, and then turned into a very, very, complex proxy war involving various parties uh, and has been in the news on and off, not so much recently, but the conflict is still ongoing, although it's not at the same uh, as it used to be. Um, the consequences are substantial. So estimates uh, talk about, about half a million of deaths and many refugees. So there's 6.2 million Syrians that are displaced within Syria, don't often hear about those. We hear mostly about those externally displaced, which is about 5.6 million. And when we look at those, so the most recent numbers, according to UNHCR, which these are the registered uh, refugees. They're more uh, refugees than those that are registered, but they're 5.6 million persons of concern. So these are registered with UNHCR. And most of them are in Turkey and then followed by Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq, Egypt, and as well some in North Africa. I think what's important to uh, consider is that most of the refugees remain in the Middle East. And that's obviously true of mo most refugee um, settings, that refugees tend to, well, be displaced within their country and then end up in neighboring countries. Although there's, in particular in Europe, there has been a lot of debates and a lot of, uh, at, at the moment, again, with uh, the situation in, in Belarus and Poland, with refugees coming over to Europe, but actually 
most of them are in the Middle East, and it's only a small proportion of the refugees that have fled to Europe. Importantly, for us, for, for my work, is that 50% of the Syrian refugees are children, and um, they are significantly affected by the crisis. Uh, one important aspect is that they are often not often don't have access to school. And that's as well the, the case with our sample. So in our sample, um, with uh, families that have been in Lebanon for several years, about 40% of the children have access to school. And the, the others not, even though they are in a, you know, in a, in a relatively stable refugee environment. Uh, what do we know about the mental health of Syrian refugee children? Well, there are more studies uh, more recently, and they actually suggest that there's a, quite a range. So when we look at PTSD, the prevalence rates range from 10% or 11% to 45. Similarly for anxiety, between about 10% to 50%. We see the same with depression, between 12 to, to 48%. So this suggests that there is wide variability in those prevalence estimates. Uh, so we need to do more to find out what's it, what is actually the number um, that we're looking at. Um, and there is likely a significant need for mental health treatment in Syrian refugee children. And I'll report more on that later. So it's obviously important to do research in order to understand the mental health problems as well as the needs of Syrian refugee children. But also, and that's what we try to do, is to identify the specific factors and processes that are involved in risk and resilience of these children. And that's important because it would inform programs as well as interventions. And while we know quite a bit about adverse events and uh, negative outcomes, it's also important to focus on protective factors because it might be easier to, or more feasible, to strengthen protective factors than prevent adverse um, situations from happening. Because if there is a conflict is ongoing, we can't resolve the conflict, but we can strengthen what, you know, the protective factors amongst those children and families. And hopefully, you know, that sort of research would help to also allocate resources to those interventions and services where they're most likely to benefit um, the refugee children. The three specific factors that are important, that I think are uh, important to consider in that sort of research. And the first one is developmental, uh, that development occurs in nested contexts, as proposed by Yuri Bronfenbrenner in his ecological systems theory. So when we look at an individual developing, we always need to consider the developmental context of that individual. And uh, Bronfen Brenner suggested that an individual is nested within a whole range of different systems. So most importantly would be the microsystems. This is the immediate context of the child. So that would be the family, peers, the school environment. But these environments are further influenced by the availability of services uh, on the exosystem, but also by cultural factors on the macrosystem. So if you want to understand the development of the individual, we have to also consider all these different systems that uh, represent the context within the, which the child is developing, but also the factors that then have an impact on the context within the child is developing. So that's really important. Another important consideration is that we can look at multiple levels of analysis. So in psychology, which is my background, we often look at the behavioral, we ask people to complete questionnaires or we interview them. Uh, but in order to really understand the pathways across different levels of analysis, we also need to look at ne the neurological level, at the biochemical level, or at the molecular level, at the, at the far end uh, of uh, extremes at the genetic level. Um, and ideally we do all of that to understand how they, how they all influence each other and whether the behavior reflects what happens on the biological level and so forth. And the last point I already alluded to is that it's important to not just look at the absence of disease, but also at the presence of positive outcomes. So there has been a lot of work that would focus on the negative effects of risk factors on maladaptive outcomes. 
And we need to do more work to also look at protective factors and the positive effects on adaptive outcomes. Obviously, um, uh, some work has been done on that, but I think it's really important to not just not forget that health is more than just the absence of disease. So we try to do all of that in the Biopath study. And the Biopath study is a collaboration between myself and colleagues at Queen Mary University of London and Eli Karam and colleagues at Idraq in Lebanon. And then our fieldwork partner was Médecins du Monde and it was funded by NICHD. So the focus of the study is really looking at individual differences in response to war and displacement. We know that millions of children are affected by war and displacement, that many of them develop psychological problems. However, some do not develop psychological problems. They seem to be resilient. And this study is really trying to understand the biological underpinnings of such individual differences in response to uh, war and displacement, taking into account multiple settings, as I mentioned with the biological systems theory, looking at the family environment, school environment, the community, the neighborhood, availability of services, but also looking across multiple levels of analysis. So looking at the environmental factors, social, but also psychological, neuroendocrine, epigenetic, and genetic factors. And then we look at both risk and protective factors, both adaptive and maladaptive outcomes. I will not present um, findings about the adaptive outcomes today. I'm not going to talk about well-being outcomes. Mostly we'll talk about mental health outcomes, but we will consider both risk and protective factors. And an important aspect of this study is uh, it's a longitudinal design. It's very difficult to do longitudinal research in these settings, or it's very ch challenging to do any research in these settings, uh, but longitudinal research is particularly uh, challenging. Uh, so that's why many of the studies are cross-sectional. And um, when I mentioned all these, th these points, uh, Catherine obviously uh, collected data where she did all of those things as well. And is one of the few uh, studies that have achieved a longitudinal study looking at multiple levels of analysis and settings. Uh, the study design is that basically we were interested in war exposure and displacement and how it has an impact on both risk and resilience captured with psychological and biological outcomes. That's the main question. Then we want to understand how environmental risk and protective factors outside of war exposure and displacement, as well as genetic factors also have an impact on these outcomes and how they moderate the impact that war exposure has on these outcomes. And then an important aspect of the study is to see whether the impact of environmental risk factors, war exposure and genes are mediated through uh, DNA methylation and impacted by genetic factors and further environmental risk factors on those outcomes. So that's a baseline. And then we look at all those factors again, 12 months later in the follow-up assessment. We did that uh, with a sample of close to 1,600 families. So these are the children plus their primary caregivers. So the total sample is therefore uh, about, it's more than 3,000. The age range that we aimed for is between eight to 16 years. And we collected that data in end of 2017, early 2018. And then a year later, we did a follow-up assessment and uh, we were aiming for uh, about two thirds of the, uh, of the sample. That's what we expected we would be able to get. So we didn't actually have the funding to collect data from more. We would have been able to collect a bit more than these, but there is about a mobility of uh, about two thirds. So within a year, a third of the refugees tend to move on. A little bit about the sample that we collected. So an important point is that uh, our recruitment rate was about 70%. That means 70% of all the families that we approached for inclusion in the study said yes. So that suggests that our sample is, is sort of representative of the refugee population where we, we recruited from. And I'll share a bit more details about um, the location. We ended up with a fairly balanced gender split between female and male children. The age range ended up between six to 19 years of age. We aimed for a 
broad uh, age range because we wanted to look at developmental questions as well. We knew we, it would be very difficult to have more than two waves of data collection. So we did sort of a, a compromise, having a wide age range and then collecting data longitudinally once uh, at, at time, two time points, which allows us to look at uh, longitudinal questions and taking the developmental age um, of children into account as well. Most of them are Syrian. Not surprisingly, the caregiver was in most cases uh, the mother and in a small, uh, small number of fathers. The measures, uh, we collected a lot of different measures. So this is just a, a very simple summary. So we basically correct, uh, collected data on child and care, from child and caregiver. We collected data on their psychopathology, on their well-being, and then a wide range of protective and risk factors across the individual, uh, the social environment, and the, 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 the wider social environment. And an important feature is that we also collect the biological samples. So we have saliva that we collected for genetic analysis and epigenetic analysis. Both of these are genome-wide, so we, uh, we have genome-wide genetic data and epigenome-wide epigenetic data, so that's DNA methylation. And we also collected hair samples to look at three neuroendocrine variables, so most importantly the cortisol. Uh, so, which I will talk Michael, about. Uh, I have a couple of clarification questions. Hi, this is Arasio. Hello, good to see uh, you. <laughs> nice to see you too. Um, the genetic data you collect only on the children or also the parents? And it's only the children. So the biological data is only from, from the children. Okay. And any reason why you only did uh, 6 to 19 rather than younger children? The reason is that we collected uh, data from the children and they needed to be able to respond, uh, basically to complete um, the data collection. The data was not collected uh, in written form. It was all in interview. But the, the main reason is that we wanted to ensure that our measures would be suitable for, for that, that age of children. So if he wanted to collect data from younger children, we probably would have to use different measures for them. Yeah. So one of the challenges is to find measures that work for an age range between eight uh, and, and, and 18. Okay, yeah. well, we can talk about it at some point, but go ahead. Yeah, right, thank you. Okay, the location, uh, you will probably know where uh, Lebanon is based. Uh, the important thing is that Lebanon is pretty much surrounded by Syria, uh, as you can see. So that's one of the reasons why many Syrian refugees ended up in Lebanon. Within Lebanon, we collected data, which actually is, is a fairly small country. Uh, we collected all of our data in the West Bekaa Valley. So this is uh, about an hour an hour and a half uh, away from Beirut uh, by car. Uh, and some of the settlements are fairly close to Syria, so maybe just a, a 10 minute drive from the Syrian border. Um, and we collected data from about 80 different refugee settlements. And here is an example of one of those refugee settlements. These are all informal settlements and relatively small settlements. Here is a, a typical one. You can see that they have Tented structures, they have satellite dishes on them. So they've been living there for some of them for, for several years already. Uh, but it's still, it's still a difficult life, um, even though they have relatively solid tented structures. It does rain and it does snow in this region and it's, it's quite difficult living there. And here is um, the, the team that collected data in, at wave one. So we had 20 field workers, uh, two different teams that went from settlement to settlement. All the data was collected uh, in interviews and we used uh, tablets to do so. So the interviewer was asking all the questionnaire questions directly to the child in Arabic and then was recording that in the tablets. Then we're uploading the data the same day onto the service. So we were basically had real time data. We always knew at the end of the day what data has been collected and were able to look at that data. At the same time as the child was interviewed, another member of the team was interviewing the caregiver in a different 
um, section of the tent or outside, which is the case here. And I have a little video um, that provides a bit more of the context. So let me share that. So this, the sound is not very loud, but the, it's in Arabic. Uh, so I don't know how many of you speak Arabic. I don't. Um, so that it's translated into English. So you can read at the bottom. But the sound is not very loud, but hopefully you'll get a bit of a, the context of the study. All right, I hope you got a little bit of a flavor of the data collection. Um, it was quite challenging to get this uh, study uh, approved by all the different ethics committees, um, not so much in the UK, but in Lebanon. So it took quite a while to get this um, through and it was quite challenging collecting the data, but the team did an excellent job. And we managed to collect, uh, I would say, very high quality data on, on a large sample. So I will, I will share some of these findings. Much of that is still in the progress. So these are papers, uh, none, of, none of those papers are published yet, but they are either submitted in, in, uh, on the review or they um, are to be submitted very soon. So these are still sort of uh, somewhat preliminary findings in, in some cases. Um, the first findings I want to present is about mental health needs and treatment. And um, the research question that we want to address with this analysis is the following. We wanted to look at what is the prevalence of mental health problems amongst our sample of Syrian refugee children. We wanted to look at what are the, the main predictors of those mental health problems. We also wanted to look at what is the perceived need for treatment of Syrian refugee children. And we asked the children as well as the caregivers whether they think their child would need uh, treatment of mental health problems. And the last question, we then also wanted to look at what are common barriers to available mental health services, asking uh, the families whether they are aware of any services available to them and whether they would use them. And if not, why not? This uh, particular paper is the work of my postdocs, uh, Fiona McEwen and Claudine Biazzoli. So, a little bit about the measures here. So we used self established self-report uh, scales to measure mental health. So for depression, we used the CESD. For anxiety, we used the scare. Both of those were shortened to reduce the burden uh, of data collection. Uh, they were reduced based on very carefully conducted pilot studies. Um, so we've basically co collected data on all of the items and then run some factor analysis and re reduce them to uh, shorten them. The PTSD scale was the full scale 
And externalizing problems was the SDQ items, but we added some additional items that we created based on DSM-5 for conduct disorder um, and ODD. And all those were on based on child reporting step extern externalizing problems. When we collected externalizing problems based on child reports in pilot studies, um, that data was not very reliable. So uh, the other data seemed to be more reliable on, on child report, but externalizing problems was based on caregiver report. In addition, we conducted uh, clinical interviews in a subsample with the mini kid. Um, and that was a subsample of 134 children that were at different levels of risk in order to create a representative uh, sample that represents the, the total sample. So we conduct those interviews in Arabic um, with the help of a local clinical psychologist and two trained counselors, either in the clinic or in settlements. And then all those cases were discussed with uh, the clinical supervisor before agreeing on a diagnosis. And here are the findings. So we have basically data on from clinical assessments in a subsample of 134 children. We then created cutoff scores based on that sample that we apply to the rest of the sample based on child self-report and caregiver report. But we also, as a third option, we ask the caregivers after asking them to complete um, their self-report about their own mental health, we ask them, what do you think your child is suffering from those problems as well? So, and what we got here is the clinical sample. We got relatively high levels, but within the margins that all of you indicated at the very beginning. So post-traumatic stress disorder was about 40% based on clinical interviews. Externalizing problems around 27%, depression around 20%. Anxiety disorders was very high with close to 50%. And what is interesting is that ADHD is not much higher than we would expect um, in non-refugee samples. Um, so it's particular depression, uh, PTSD, and anxiety disorders that, uh, and externalizing those that are particularly higher than would be in other child samples. When we, based on those findings, then created cutoff scores for our other measures and applied that to the whole sample, uh, we basically found the same thing, which is not surprising given that the cutoffs are based on the clinical sample but that's basically replicated across the whole sample. Uh, actually, the anxiety disorder measure was normally distributed and um, we, we, we are very cautious using the anxiety measure here um, because we, we don't think it's a good measure. Uh, it's not a good measure to use to indicate uh, mental health problems in this particular um, sample. The same measure that we used with our cutoffs has been used by our colleagues uh, in Turkey in a different, in a Syrian refugee sample living in Istanbul. And they found much lower prevalence rates. And I think that our sample is of particular high vulnerability. So the third finding is that we ask caregivers to, uh, to report on what they think, whether their child needs help. And interestingly, we find that it's fairly, similar to our uh, cutoff scores and clinical interviews. So 35% of the caregivers thought that their child uh, needs help for PTSD or has significant PTSD problems. And with depression, it was a little bit higher than the others with anxiety, so it was a, bit, a little bit lower. We only asked them in relation to PTSD, depression, and anxiety. I think the most Thank important, you. yes? Sorry, if it's okay to jump in. I still have Absolutely. a question on that. So for the caregiver reports, are these, um, whether they think that their child is experiencing this or whether they, I guess, both think their child is experiencing this and should receive professional care? Um, yes, I have to specify that. We, this particular question was whether their child has, is suffering from those problems. Basically, we, we've, the, the caregivers re, uh, completed their own PTSD measure. Once they completed their own PTSD measure, they were interviewed about that. They were also asked, is any other member in your family suffering from those problems? Is your child suffering from problems like that? 
And then in a consequent question, we ask them about whether the child needs help. So that's why I confused those things. But yeah, so they were always asked, the data that you see here is when they were asked whether their, their child is suffering from similar problems as the ones that the caregiver just reported. I think the main thing to take away from this scale, uh, from this table here is that when we look at any mental health problem, uh, we look at prevalence rates close to 60%. So very high. Initially, we looked at the self-report scales and we thought maybe that's going to be lower once we look at the clinical uh, interview data. But even with clinical interviews, there were individual interviews conducted by mental health, uh, by trained people, um, we get very similar scores. So a very high prevalence of mental health problems. The next one is finding is looking at comorbidity. And I don't want to say too much about that, but this is, these are the comorbidity findings in the clinical sample, right? So we, we have the same as well in with the self-report data and findings look very similar. Do you and the main message here is, as would be expected, comorbidity is the norm. So in almost 90% of the cases, we have comorbidity usually involving PTSD and something else. Uh, sorry, do you mind if I just ask quickly uh, yep. what the rates in the previous table were in Turkey and whether you think this... Oh, in Turkey. Yeah, and also um, whether you think that it, the discrepancies indicate um, uh, differences in prior experiences before arriving to the country or because of environmental factors um, or just like the income of that family. Um, yes, yeah, so I don't, I don't remember the exact numbers, but where we found about 50% of children are above the cutoff scores for anxiety. In the Turkish sample, it was, I think, between 5 and 10%, so significantly lower. And we think, so we, this is still something that we have to look at, but we think that our sample probably you know, are living in very much more difficult uh, context and may have more of a uh, higher war exposure, but we haven't compared that. So I can't say whether that's the case, but what seems to be the case is that the context that they're living in right now might be much more challenging in Lebanon than in Turkey. Yeah, I mean, uh, And that might explain some of that. That, that, that's certainly been my understanding as someone that has done work in Turkey and seen the statistics in Lebanon. It's, it's the conditions are way worse. But then, of course, I you know you're always curious about uh, you, you understand that a lot of that is from the current environmental circumstances. But then you also wonder uh, how much of this also relates to the prior circumstances. Thank you. Sure. Well, actually, my next slide addresses some of those questions because we look at the predictors, and that's a busy table. So. Um, I just wanted to communicate the main message here. So we looked at demographic factors, war events, perceived refugee environment is the quality of the current environment that includes access to facilities, living conditions, um, the social context within the family and the community. So a whole range of different factors. This is a measure that we created from scratch uh, based on various pilot studies. And we also looked at child uh, caregiver child relationship and caregiver mental health symptoms and what you can see is that war events are important they predict all the outcomes that we looked at but actually the strongest predictor was the current environment and the, so the higher the score the higher the quality of the of the environment so that's why you see the negative relationships here but the effects of the current environment is is a much higher than that of war events. Uh, an important predictor was also mal maltreatment in the family and also uh, caregiver mental health problems. Michael? Yeah. Could I, could I ask you a question yeah. until we find out uh, how to get this person um, on, on mic'd up? Um, 
and I know you may be able to say that, but I'm just going to ask it quickly. The um, maltreatment question is obviously an extremely sensitive question to ask to families and caregivers. So, and it's one that's really interesting to many scholars. Can you just elaborate a little bit about how you get these data? So this is the ICAST measure that we used. And we, um, so Eli Karam, who, who is a co-PI on the study, they've used that same measure in previous studies um, in similar samples. So we knew a little bit from their experience what questions would be more acceptable and less, and we excluded certain questions that would be unethical to ask. Okay. Um, but I think uh, important to uh, maybe realize here is that relatively harsh parenting is much more accepted in that cultural context than compared to here. So I did, it, it often felt that neither the, child, the children nor the parents would necessarily find it unusual to report some of the behaviors that we would find a bit more alarming here. Maybe you can continue. Our, our question okay. from the room is going to try and come through the chat via various people. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so then uh, an, a very important finding is when we ask them, the caregivers, whether they are interested in receiving mental health treatment for their child, that was only 25% or 25.6%. So there's quite a disparity between the, ment the children that seem to be at risk of men significant me mental health problems and the caregivers that felt that their child would benefit from treatment. So we then asked them about the awareness of services and, and less than 50% were aware of any services. We asked them whether they've used any and only very few used any of the available services. The majority of services used were those delivered in the communities. And then we asked them about reasons why they are not using services. Most of them said, well, they don't have a need for treatment. And for those that had a need for treatment, but still, did not use them, the reasons were that they were not aware of services or didn't know, did not know how to access them, thought that they were too expensive. There were transport issues. Uh, Lebanon doesn't really have public transport, so that's a big challenge. And then a few people also mentioned stigma um, and security issues. So I have quite a few other findings to um, to share, so I'd like to move on, but I'll come back to some of those findings and what they could mean. So the second set of, um, of well, actually two studies is looking at risk and resilience. And the question that we were addressing here is firstly, you wanted to see how many Syrian refugee children could we consider as resilient within that sample? Second question, what factors differentiates the resilient children from those at risk? And the third question, how does resilience change over time and what predicts those changes? And then what is the directionality of detected associations when looking at the development of resilience over time? And this is the work conducted by my PhD student, Cassandra Popham, who is in the process of writing up all these findings. So the first question is, what is resilience? And how do we define resilience? Uh, lots of people define resilience in different ways. So we stuck to a fairly simple uh, definition. Resilience is positive development despite adversity. So basically, refugee children that experienced war but did not develop mental health problems. That's our definition of resilience. And we did that across multiple dimensions. So many studies that look at resilience may only look at depression or only look at PTSD, but we said a resilient child is one that is below the cutoffs of these three um, outcomes here, below depression, PTSD, and externalizing problems. And that was about 20% of the sample. So 20% were below these three cutoffs. We didn't consider anxiety because anxiety didn't differentiate well between risk and resilience. Um, if a child was above one or more cutoffs, they were considered in the risk at risk group, and that was the remaining 80%. So we had about 20% that we considered resilient and 80 at risk for mental health problems. In the next step, we looked at war exposure, and uh, you can 
War exposure was measured with a, uh, a scale with 25 items. So usually that's used by just summing up all those different war events in a total scale. But we wanted to look more carefully at war exposure. And we also, in addition to the total score, looked at sort of the different types that children experience, the different types of war exposure that they had. So there was a small um, number of children that didn't report any war exposure. Uh, importantly as well, war exposure was based on child report and caregiver report. If any of them reported a war event, then we considered them uh, as, as happened. So it was the combination of child and caregiver report. So there was uh, some children that predominantly experienced bombardment, but not any of the others. So they were in the, that theoretical group of bombardment. And um, the most, most severe was bodily harm. Basically, if children experienced bodily harm, they experienced most of the other event, events as well. We created those different groupings in order to match children uh, based on their war exposure. So we matched... We, we selected the resilient children, all of the resilient children, and we tried to match each of these children with one that is at risk, so is in the risk group, but has similar war exposure. So we matched them for each resilient child. We tried to find one child that has the same total score in war exposure, but also the same theoretical group. So, for example, this child here is in the resilient group and experienced bodily harm and has a fairly high score. We matched that child with another child that is in risk group that has high, that has mental health problems and a similar war exposure in order to look at individual differences or what predicts why are some children that have the same war exposure than children that have mental health problems, why do they not have mental health problems? So then we conducted logistic regressions to identify the factors that differentiate between risk and resilience. So basically, we have children that have identical war exposure. Some children developed mental health problems, others did not. And we wanted to see what factors differentiate between the two. And so we looked at the whole range of factors, as you can see here. So these are the odds ratios. The, the we all we conducted individual models for each of these um, predictors, but then also combined them and corrected for multiple corrections. So the, the dark blue ones are the ones that survived corrections. So I'll only have a look at those. So self-esteem was one of them. Self-esteem might be a correlate of good mental health, right? So we don't really say with this analysis whether this is a correlate or the predictor. It's just something that differentiates this group. Children in the resilience group tend to have higher self-esteem. Children in the risk group tend to have caregivers with more PTSD problems, uh, experience more child maltreatments, have caregivers with high depression, um, experience more loneliness, and also have higher scores on environmental sensitivity. This is a temperament trait that reflects heightened sensitivity to the environment, both negative and positive experiences. So this is what we found. And then the next um, study, we wanted to look at the change in resilience over time. And this is a quite a busy figure here. But basically, we have the baseline and we have the follow-up data. At baseline, that's just what I showed you. 20% are in the resi resilience group and the re remaining 80% in the high-risk group. When we look at those groupings again at the follow-up, we do see that now at the follow-up, there's 30% in the resilient group and about 66% in the high-risk group. However, there is considerable change over time. There is a group that is stable, stably resilient, but there is um, a significance about half of the children that are in the resilient group at wave one are no longer in the resilient group at wave two. So that means they, they had a significant increase in mental health problems. And we defined that at least a 20% change in one of the mental health outcomes. So they are above at least one cutoff 
and at least 20% change. So that it's not just a, a minimal change, just slightly above the cutoff. These are significant changes. On average, the change that we saw is 40% increase. Uh, so Michael, I have another question to try to understand this picture. Uh, so the definition of risk here is if they've been exposed to, to war. No, the definition of risk here is being above at least one of the cutoffs of our three mental health outcomes. So, Michael, can I ask you a question as well? Yeah. And you also have a question in the chat. Um, you know, uh, we've discussed that given that our work, for instance, is actually measuring resilience as opposed to assuming it de facto from the presence or absence of mental health symptoms. Um, there is a reason why you did not do that, and that's probably because you work in a younger age group. But um, I'm just wondering why you call them resilient and risk in term, instead of calling them just low risk and high risk. In other words, why do you label them resilient, resilient children? Because that is not measuring resilience, it's measuring the absence of symptoms. Yes, yeah, so, um, um, so these are all valid points. So we refer to them as resilient when we match them on the war exposure because they had war exposure, but they did not develop mental health problems. In the current analysis, actually, we talk about low and high risk because okay. they're not matched on war exposure. Here, we just look at low, basically low mental health and uh, high mental health. But the, the war exposure definition refers to uh, events prior to the baseline? Yes. And yeah. could it be that uh, the, the children that uh, go from uh, blue to pink is because their experience new, so it's not much driven by their resilience but, uh, or changing in resilience, but uh, additional environmental factors. Like, yeah, exactly, exactly. That's that's an important. It's important to realize that even though maybe when we look at war exposure, some children seem to be resilient, the context of displacement itself leads to new trauma, and even though a child might have been resilient at one point, doesn't necessarily mean that child will remain resilient or will remain at low risk of mental health, even in that context of displacement, we see changes. Most of that change though, is from children being at higher risk to no longer be at higher risk. But it's really a dynamic development over time where the majority of children don't really change, um, but some children change, but not only from higher risk to low risk, but also from lower risk to high risk. And I think that's an important message that we don't, think that once we measure mental health and it's low, then it will stay like that because they're living in a very challenging context where they experience new trauma as well, that there is considerable change. We actually looked in that paper, we look at the predictors for all of these different groups. And I just mentioned some of the stable high and stable low. So they're fairly similar to what I showed earlier. Um, so it is caregiver mental health, it's maltreatment, is it's aspects of the family environment, such as parent-child conflict or maternal acceptance, and then individual factors such as sensitivity being higher in those at higher risk and self-esteem being higher in those that are at a low, in the low risk group. Michael, you have two questions. So I just want to reiterate, it's really important to know that trajectories are malleable over time and that's why intervention is, um, you know, really important at, at that kind of age group. So thank you for, for that message. Uh, you have two questions, if I can ask you quickly. Uh, Candice yeah. Mack has a question on how is war events measured in these analyses? And you have another question from the person in the room um, on the symptomology, when they report a symptomology of mental illnesses, whether uh, they were, I think you answered that, were caregiver educa educated, were caregiver told about the kind of symptomology of the mental illness prior to the interview or were they just proffered the questions? So one on the measurement of war events and the other on the um, kind of context information you gave caregivers before they answered um, sure. questions on mental health. So war events were measured with the war events questionnaire by 
uh, uh, collaborator, Eli Karam. He's that has been developed for the Middle East uh, and has been used uh, previously. And it's basically 25 items that you can sum up or, you know, that, that was a question how we should use that data. So we, we use the total score. We, we've done a whole range of analysis on that and we'll, we'll uh, write a paper as well on the war events. But basically it's 25 different items for different sort of typical war events that happen. And we asked that the child about that as well as the caregiver. We asked the child about the war exposure the war events it experienced, but also the caregiver about the war events the child experienced, and we combined the two. So it's a, a pretty solid measure of war events. There's still lots of issues with that, by the way, but I, I don't think I can go into that now. Um, the mental health, so caregivers knew a little bit about the study from the recruitment process, but they didn't know about the specific mental health disorders and we asked about them. So we just asked the questions. They didn't have to complete the questionnaire themselves. They were asked in an interview. So if they had questions, they could always ask the interviewer for clarifications. Uh, and these are all established mental health measures. And then you obviously we create a cutoff based on clinical interviews. Okay, the next slide is just one example of looking at bi-directional relationships because we have longitudinal data here. And this is the example of caregiver depression and child symptoms. So the child symptoms here are uh, standardized and summed across the three um, mental health outcomes. So this, this is a continuous measure of mental health. And it, importantly, um, we would expect that child, that caregiver depression might increase the child uh, mental health symptoms, right? But what we also find is that the child symptoms, the child mental health symptoms over time has an impact on caregiver depression. And that actually we find for quite a few of those risk factors. So it's not just the environment that has an impact on the child, but it's also the child that has an impact on the environment. And I think that's a very important aspect as well to consider for interventions. And I'll come back to that in implications. Let me move on to the biology. Um, and with the biology, I'll go a bit quicker. Um, I could say much about that, but um, <clears throat> I'll summarize those final scenes a little bit more succinctly. So we wanted to look here. So we're still at, at the beginning of looking at the biological data, uh, COVID, uh, shut down the labs in London, which meant it's a long time that we couldn't actually get to our samples. Uh, but everything is analyzed now. Uh, I mean, everything is genotyped and everything is ready for analysis. So we've looked at the hair cortisol in relation to PTSD and war. So we wanted to know whether hair cortisol reflects the ex exposure to war. We also wanted to look at whether hair cortisol is associated with PTSD in children. So all of this is in children. And then uh, we've done some work on the role of epigenetics in psychological resilience. And that reflects work by my postdoc, Demelsa Smith. And so first question, we looked at war exposure and cortisol. And we did find associations, but they were not very robust. When we included age of the children, uh, that correlation was no longer significant. What we then did, we looked at the association between war events and cortisol in depending on the age of exposure of the children. And what we found was really interesting in that there was an association, but only in children that were in their adolescent years during the exposure to war, suggesting that adolescence is a sort of sensitive period or critical period for longer lasting biological embedding of war exposure. So that was only in that group um, that were older than 12 years. We then looked at uh, PTSD and we found that there was a, a robust association between PTSD and cortisol, even when controlling for all the covariates. And we, we've, we have a lot of covariates and we control for all of them. Um, in the next step, we looked at the mediating effects. We wanted to see whether war exposure, uh, whether cortisol or, or uh, PTSD mediates the effects of war exposure. And what we found is that there is a partial mediation 
uh, between of the effect of more exposure on cortisol by PTSD. Um, when we ran the opposite, testing whether cortisol was mediating effects between war and PTSD, there was also a partial mediation, but it was a lot less. So it seems the case that um, war uh, leads to elevated hair cortisol, particularly in those children that develop PTSD in relation to the war exposure. And I leave it at that. Uh, I know that's not very much, but basically, so the, the distance between war exposure and the measurement of cortisol is between two to four years in our sample, right? So that's quite a long distance from the initial exposure. And that was particularly the case in children that were in their adolescent years during the war exposure. And I just want to mention for the role of epigenetics, um, we actually haven't analyzed the data yet, but what we've done, we've developed the theoretical framework uh, that we will use to uh, look at epigenetics. And to take into account genetic factors, because genetic factors act upon the epigenome or DNA methylation, but they might also be stable methylation uh, over time. And then obviously there are protective factors and adverse adversity that together then result in epigenetic signatures that are associated with resilience. Um, there's a lot more to be said about that, but I don't, we don't have any analysis yet, but this is basically the framework that we're gonna use. I'm happy to share that paper with anyone that's interested in having a closer look at that. But let me move on to the treatment of Syrian refugee children. And, uh, how to do that over telephone. We thought that was a really innovative thing to do. And then COVID-19 hit and suddenly the whole world was doing uh, treatment over the telephone. But actually, when I was thinking about that idea and I spoke to several people in the field before COVID, most people said, no, we don't really do that uh, in those settings. And no one was you know, even thinking about doing that in the future. But why could it be important? Well, we know that children, that experience war at a higher risk for development of mental health problems, but also that many don't, ex don't receive treatment. And that's for a range of reasons. It's often very difficult to, to um, set up new services in those settings. It's difficult to recruit qualified staff and refugees are often not mobile. They can't just go to a clinic that easily. So we wanted to adapt an existing treatment for delivery over telephone with the help of trained and supervised lay counselors. And then we wanted to evaluate the feasibility, acceptability and efficacy of this new treatment with Syrian refugee children in Lebanon. And we were using that, we basically uh, using the Biopath study to recruit people into our clinical trial. And, and basically these are all the children, all the families that said they would like help if they met the inclusion criteria of our clinical trial they were offered inclusion in the clinical trial. If not, they were receiving other treatments. We had several psychologists working and counselors working with us. So we provided free treatment to every single person that was associated, affiliated with the family that participated in the study. Um, so this is basically the biopath sample. The intervention is CETA, common elements treatment approach. And this is a modular transdiagnostic therapy developed for those kind of settings and is based on the most effective uh, cognitive behavioral therapy components. We first developed the TCETA manual by delivering CETA face-to-face -face and some piloting and then we ran a, a randomized controlled trial which ended up being very small to evaluate the feasibility, acceptability and efficacy. The measures that we used were the same mental health symptom scales that I, we used uh, for the rest of the Biopath study. We used it's the same clinical interview. Um, in addition, we had in-session assessments. That was the client monitoring form, which is part of the treatment. So every session, the counselor is completing a short assessment of the child. Uh, also the Cyclops was used at the beginning and the last session as well in the middle. And then we also, uh, completed some qualitative research. So we interviewed the counselors that delivered TCETA uh, 
and we interviewed 11 families that received T-seed, so both the child as well as the caregiver. We ended up with a very small sample uh, in our RCT. It was very difficult recruiting children and families into this study. Um, actually, from all the children that initially, or, and families that initially expressed an interest, uh, only 7% ended up receiving treatment, even though that treatment was uh, over phone. Because we end up with a very small sample of about 20 children, so 10 in the treatment and 10 in the control condition, the control condition was treatment as usual. Uh, we used the Bayesian analysis approach um, to help us with that. And we were able to show that uh, there are uh, significant um, treatment effects of the TC to condition with a moderate effect size of about 0.33. It's hard to interrupt. I mean, do you mind saying a little bit about why you think the take up was so low? I mean, it seems this is a very vulnerable population. Uh, are there security concerns? Um, they don't agree with the intervention. Uh, yeah, it would be great to just. Yeah, so we, we actually have conducted a qualitative study exactly on that. Um, and uh, to some degree, uh, when they were asked to uh, attend the intake session, which was in the clinic, the intake session was in the clinic, the treatment was over phone or in the clinic, depending on what they were randomized into. Um, quite a few parents thought they no longer have, a, the children no longer have a problem or it's not actually not too bad. Uh, I think there were work commitments that, getting, that were getting in the, in the way, the work commitments of the child, or of the caregiver, transport issues. Uh, so quite a few logistic problems, but also um, I would say um, a limited understanding of mental health problems that need treatment. So these were some of the points that came up. But we, we are still working on the analysis of, of, of that data. Thank you, Michael, that's a really interesting observation actually, but uh, I'm just flagging that we have seven minutes left. So. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. I will, I will get through. Um, so the, the positive effects of the treatment was mostly driven by the, the reduction in depression symptoms. Then we also looked at the in-session assessment, and you can see here with the client monitoring form that there is really a very a steep decrease over time in all the children that receive treatment. That was also shown in the Cyclops, which measures problems functioning and well-being. So it was high baseline and then significantly reduced towards the, the final session, and these changes were significant. The qualitative findings, I could say a lot about that, but I'll keep that really short. So we looked at the feasibility by interviewing the counselors. Three themes emerged. Basically, they found that, that delivering therapy over the phone solves some problems, but it also creates some additional practical and logistical challenges, such as bad connections with the phones or finding a space where the child could speak without being heard by others. They generally found that the T-CETA was adapted well to uh, overcome cultural blocks and that T-CETA works and is needed. To some, uh, to some degree, they were surprised that it worked as well as it did. I think some of the counselors were quite um, skeptical whether this would work but generally they found that it would work. When we interviewed the caregivers and the children, four themes emerged actually quite similar. Again, that it solves some problems, but also creates some challenges. That TCTA works for most families, but there are some challenges that remain in other families that can't be solved easily because the, the, the challenging context remains a challenging context. Another factor was that the relationship between the counselor and the child and caregiver was very important, and that the family's attitude to mental health was also uh, very important. Uh, important to mention, this intervention was not just focusing on the individual child, but also, there was also a parenting uh, component to it. So caregivers were involved in it. So let me, in the last few minutes, uh, discuss what we found. So basically, we found mental health problems are frequent. Every second child reports significant problems. 25.6% um, of caregivers, when asked, said they would like to receive treatment for their child. So that suggests there is 
a significant perceived need for mental health services and also willingness to use them. However, the majority of these children never receive treatment, and that is to various barriers. Um, we found that about 20% of the sample met our criteria for resilience. That is a lot less than in other studies. And the reason it's a lot less is because we define resilience as being below the cutoffs of multiple dimensions of mental health outcomes. If we would have looked at only PTSD and considered anyone that is below the cutoff of PTSD or resilience, our resilience proportion would be much more similar to previous studies, but it's really important to look at across multiple dimensions. And we identified a range of factors that are associated with risk and resilience. We uh, found that war exposure and mental health problems are associated with biological factors and that biological embedding seems to be particularly in those uh, children, the case that were exposed to in adolescence. We successfully adapted a treatment to be delivered over the telephone. Uh, children allocated to TC, so telephone delivered CETA, significantly improved over time, but the randomized control trial was very small and findings need to be replicated in larger studies. But the qualitative research uh, suggests that both counselors and families that received help found the treatment effective. But TCTA may not be a solution that works for in every situation and every family. And I want to end with some of the implications. The main implications of this is that many refugee children suffer from significant mental health problems. We know that, but that number is actually quite high. And most of these children never receive treatment. And even when we offer them treatment over the phone, most of them don't receive treatment. And actually quite a few children that receive treatment drop out of treatment. We had a lot less dropout in the phone condition, but with traditional um, services, many children will drop out. We've identified several predictors that pointed to family and the wider social context as particularly relevant. And this means interventions should focus not just on the individual, but also their social context. So systemic approaches are particularly important as well as the mental health of the caregiver is it very important. We need to treat the caregiver's mental health in order to help the child. So standard delivery of treatment and programs that are usually delivered in clinics is unlikely to reach children in need. Treatment over phone will overcome some of those barriers, but not, will be not sufficient. It will, be not, will not be sufficient. I think what is really needed is community-based approaches that involve community members and that reach not only the child, but also the social context, the caregivers. That will be absolutely crucial to reach more children and to overcome this treatment gap. Just an acknowledgement of my research partners of the various funding that we receive. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you very much for threading all these disciplines through epigenetics, psychology, community-based programming. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, when I see your last slide, I say you need an anthropologist on your team, but most importantly, uh, you know, maybe you could just say a few words on your local partners because community-based approaches are spearheaded by local partners. Uh, could you just tell us a little bit about that? And then if there are the questions, uh, please raise your hand or put them in the chat. I know there was just a detailed question on the CTA approach, uh, how many sessions and over what time was that provided to people to accept? But I'd really like to uh, ask you a quick question on, on, on how local partners uh, took this together, not just the people who were implementing uh, in the field, but how they co-designed perhaps or co-implemented or um, see uh, the, the, the future directions of your work. Yeah, so this is this is future directions. We uh, are working on developing a, a community-based approach based on our experience in, in Lebanon. And we, in order to in increase the recruitment into the randomized controlled trial, we've been running sessions in the settlements. And those have been very helpful. Um, and that's really sort of where we felt that we really have to do something in the settlements because for them to leave for, for refugee families, especially many, many of those have many children. So if one child has a problem, what do they do with all the other children? That's an issue. And so that 
makes them much more less much less likely to actually uh, seek services, even if they're provided not too far from the settlement, uh, because there's, it's difficult to get there. So, um, yeah, delivering services right in the settlements is what they told us would they would like. But also, there is some stigma issues. They wouldn't like that other people know uh, that they receive treatments. That was more problem, more a problem in some settlements, less in other settlements. So there was quite a bit of uh, variability between settlements. But we found that they actually were very engaged. So we went, I was, we designed the sessions. We went with our local staff into those settlements and delivered those sessions. Well, I didn't deliver them, but my, uh, our field staff delivered them in Arabic. And we, we had large groups uh, joining in these discussions and very lively discussions. And it was actually quite helpful to identify uh, families that really are worried about their child because they, there is a significant problem. Whereas there were quite a few that thought, you know, a treatment may be, you know, interesting, but they don't necessarily didn't see uh, a clear um, need. Uh, I think a big part of that would be psychoeducation to inform them uh, about the problems that we typically see in children and at what level do they need treatment. But also, um, I think an important aspect would be to maybe uh, deliver some sessions on resilience and what promotes resilience and uh, families, strengthening the families and parenting. So that's what I would do. Um, what I think would be very crucial is to recruit community members from those settlements to actually deliver some of that or co-deliver that and co-create it. I think that's absolutely key. Thank you. Are there any quick questions? Uh, most of our participants say, thank you for a great talk, but have to go at, uh, at, at this cutoff point um, before, before nightfall. <laughs> this is winter. Um, I'm just checking, but mostly thank you very much indeed. Michael, that was a, a really great uh, presentation. I'm actually going to ask you one more question. I'm sorry, I'm really interested in this because in the Middle Eastern country context, uh, gender is a big dimension. So we know that PTSD is uh, different across gender and maybe that, I, I know you probably treated that as a uh, covariate rather than anything else, but you have any, la any uh, last thoughts on the gender dimension of your work? Interestingly, yeah. the caregivers were mothers, right? Do you have any... Yes, so we actually so we we looked at the the prevalence rate separately between uh, boys and girls, and externalizing problems, as you can imagine, are more prevalent amongst boys and, and depression more amongst girls. So there are some some differences. Um, I would I don't remember regarding war exposure whether there is some difference. I could imagine that the boys are more likely to experience war exposure because they're more likely to be outside than the girls. Um, I think that's also the case in the settlements. Some of the families that, that I visited, it, it seemed that the children are mostly within the, the tent or within the container they were living in, whereas in other families, the children were just basically outside all the time by themselves. Um, so it could vary quite a bit between different families. Yeah. Anyway, thank you very much for that big picture uh, for the very careful detailed analysis of uh, people in need and um, it was a pleasure to have you talk to us at Yale and thank you very much. You're welcome uh, thanks for Michael. yeah thanks for inviting me and thanks for the patience I, I realized there's a lot uh, of findings but I'm excited about all our findings I sort of wanted to share what we have at this stage and there's obviously there's there is lots more to be done with the data. And if anyone is interested uh, to collaborate, please get in touch with me and it might, that might be a possibility. Well, yours is a landmark study. So thank you very much indeed. Take good care. You're welcome. Take care. <laughs>